All right. So this week we're joined by Dan Aguire from the Bar Room Network. And uh, yeah, Dan, if you want to tell us a little bit about it. Oh, well, I've been doing the Bar Room for about, what, five, six years now. I work with Mr. Aldo Gandia. And you gentlemen have reached out to me a few times. And finally, uh, we're making it work. All right. Well, keep in mind, all this is on available on demand. If for some reason, you know, life is complicated, people have kids, I get it. You can't necessarily watch on YouTube whenever things are happening in the moment. But Tooch has got weekend sports betting Friday night. Again, if you can't watch, it'll be available on demand. Greg Gabriel in the house on Monday mornings. Again, he used to be in the Bears front office. So it's always, uh, you're listening to a guy that's connected, even so he knows people that are still there. You got Draft on Tap with Danny Shimon on Wednesday nights. He's the ballroom guru for watching the tape and such. And then there's Aldo and me on Tuesdays with Bear Their Souls. Uh, this week, it was fun. If you go back and listen, uh, uh, here goes a fun fact. So uh, a lady that I was dating in, in 1997, 1998, 1999, you know, you know, things happen, you break up, and you always had that, uh, that longing of like, she's the one that got away. 25 years later, we're back together and we're getting married. And um, she was on the show Tuesday night, so that was fun. She's here now. She's here now, guys. That's awesome. Her name's Nikki. If if you don't mind me having her say hi or something. Oh. Hello. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for uh, thanks for sitting there listening in. You could have chimed in. Well, congratulations. Oh no, no, no. I I just love listening to the guys talk about football. I love it. Yeah, she. Uh, all of her conversations on Tuesday re- revolved around her stripper days or dirty, filthy sex talk. So we. <laughs> She's okay listening to the Bears talk to you, though. So, like, my first question was, like, as, like, a long-term Bears fan, I'm 33, so, you know, you've got a, you know, a couple. Like, I got a decade on Bears, you. Yeah. yeah, you got a decade of Bears fandom on me. Um, So, my first, I, I do like older perspective of stuff. You know, Pauly has introduced me to a few guys on Twitter and YouTube of, like, guys who have lifelong. And I, the older I get, I feel like that matters, right? I used to think a little bit young school of, football is football now and it only matters now but like sometimes the history does end up mattering so as a long-term bears fan are there any things about like the upcoming process and like this regime like ryan poles matt eberflus the caleb williams prospect anything that gives you like similar vibes or that like kind of like a, a bad feeling or anything that feels like special or unique and something that feels like positive or negative about is the question up? basically juxtaposing something from the past versus the current process is that is i'm understanding yeah correctly? Does, does, does something give you like is this something you feel like you've seen before and you're just like you know we'll see how it shakes out or is it something that you know you feel unique it's kind of like special and maybe it gives you a little bit more optimism than it has in the past i feel like even in years that i know that if you gave me truth serum that they're going to be bad, I I just can't acquiesce to that. Like I I think every year this could be the year I've been waiting for my entire life. This could be the Super Bowl year. We'll be five and twelve, and and I still think this is the year. I can't be a fan and and come out and tell you, well, that's it, we're going to lose. Then why am I here? I I look, I don't play fantasy football. I'm not one of these dudes. It's like, well, I sure hope. Uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers throws four touchdowns today, but we somehow win. No, man, I don't play fantasy. I don't gamble. I don't really care about other teams. All my shit is here. I live and die with this team uh, to uh, uh, probably I should see therapy or something. Like I let this team affect my, my ups and downs like too much. I mean, I've gone through all these quarterbacks, man, starting with Jim McMahon and all the way through, you know, Mitch and then Justin Fields and, and then now. But I did love Fields. I loved Jay Cutler as well. Hell, I loved Rex Grossman. But, yeah, I, I really wanted to keep Fields. He's been traded now, so I'm moving on. So I'm hoping they don't f*** around. I just hope they, they take Caleb Williams and not try to outsmart people now. Because you've already traded Fields. Like, don't trade it for more picks and then hope somebody else is there. Like, don't f*** that up. That's so Chicago Bears. You know, we have this history of, of having guys who feel like they're smarter than everybody else with like Phil Emery, Mark Trestman, um, even Ryan Pace. You saw Matt Nagy. Yeah. You you know, with Ryan Pace, you saw him trading up constantly for failures. It's like, dude, you're not smarter than everybody else. And typically that's the way it goes in the NFL. And Ryan Poles, man, he, he pulled a fast one on the league. He definitely, definitely made out from trading that pick back, but it's like, okay, don't let it get to your head. You're not smarter than everybody else. This is the NFL. 
play conservative now. You won that trade. If you just coast out your career with conservative moves, you probably have a 10-year career here easily just because you won that trade. I mean, you can ride this thing out for a while now. You know what I mean? Are you guys uh, upset over the the idea that Fields, we only got a sixth round pick? I mean, it just seems like so low. We've seen some really awful quarterbacks around the league get traded. Like, I don't mean to pick on Sam Darnold or or the guy that the Steelers traded to the Eagles. Both of those, the picket guy, both of those were third round picks, I think. And Justin's only worth a sixth? Like, to me... I'm, if you're going to trade him, like I, I know you want to quote do well by him and get him with a good coach, but that still bothers me. Like he he's worthy of at least a third. Man, if Sam Darnold's worth a third, Fields is worth a second. Then like Sam Darnold, does anybody else feel it that I, way about it? I couldn't agree more with you. I always I, I have this weird balance of like business as usual uh, opinion versus a uh, you know guys talk right? It's a business at the end of the day. And there's only X amount of NFL players in the league and they all have each other's phone numbers. And so I completely agree with you. And I was on the bandwagon where I think he should have gone for like a second round pick at the very least, um, second and a fourth or something like that. That was my initial thought about it. And I still think he's going to end up being a, a legitimate starter in this league. So the only real answer I could have is, you know, Ryan Poles willingly took a pay cut or like a draft cut trade cut to put him in a situation where he could be successful because there had to be a team that had a, a worse situation for fields to go to. And I think the biggest rumor was like the Eagles to go to uh, Philadelphia for like a third or something like that. And Ryan Poles, you know, said, Hey, you know, we're going to do right by Justin. I agree with you. And so my only justification in defense of like Ryan Poles and the move is maybe he was just like, you know what, I'm going to take one on the chin a little bit, trade this guy for a, and realistically, he's it's going to be a fourth round pick. He all, the only way it stays a sixth round pick is if Justin Fields plays less than fifty percent of the Steelers' offensive snaps this whole season. So I mean, I can't fathom a world where Russell Wilson plays nine games and Justin Fields plays eight. I feel like Justin Fields is going to play probably fifteen or fourteen games. So I, I feel like that's that's my only justification for the outrage, which I agree with. Um, at the end of the day. I took, I swallowed that pill and I kind of took that one on the chin and said, you know, it's kind of part of the business because somebody's going to say, you know, a player who's going to think about signing with Chicago is going to go, well, look how they treated Justin Fields. They just shipped him out to Philadelphia to sit behind Jalen Hurts for three years while he started and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that's my take on that one. The cliche that's been said for years is, uh, you know, the Bears. If you're going to get to a level where you're going to win multiple playoff games and the Super Bowls consistently, you got to re-sign your own draft picks and build through the draft. And there's so many years that we draft players and then let them walk. So when you were mentioning Jalen Johnson, I thought the same thing. Like you got to keep some of your own draft picks sometime, right? And it seems like that never is the case for the Bears. Random. I mean, there's been one or two guys seemingly out of every draft, maybe that they keep long term. And, and so I, I agree with you saying that. Um, I really like Justin Fields. I did. I, I man, I made T-shirts. Just incredible Fields. We were walking around the parking lots during the tailgating, handing them out, making videos and stuff like that, dude. So I, I was all in on the guy. But you yeah. know, you said it yourself, man. You went to four games. One of them, Tyson Bajan started. That's the only victory you saw. Yeah. That, that's and the rough. Denver game, we had a twenty-eight to seven I, lead. I in, know, and he in the second the ball half at the end. And, and but yeah. listen, but we also did, didn't kick a field goal when we should have. So there's multiple things you could point at. However, I really felt that this was the year for Fields to take a strong step forward, and he didn't. He got hurt for more games than he's been out for in the past, and the numbers still look pretty pedestrian. And so I I understood the situation, and I understood why because you wind up with the number one overall pick it's just leverage wise man there's just so much against fields you're gonna have to move on you know whereas for example if carolina wins a couple more games and we have pick six and pick nine i think you write it out with justin fields right so i mean it's that close right i don't think he's terrible a lot of people say oh he's terrible no he's to me in my opinion he's very average right now does he still have room to grow yeah i think so he still has some potential he still has life in this league um will it happen i don't know i hope hope the best for him but you know but then getting a six round pick in return like david said that had to be kind of like you know biting the bullet and th there were rumors out there about you know more draft capital that we could have gotten for him 
Yeah, at the end of the day, I, I think I'm a little bit more old school in my thought. And, like, you know, I've shared this opinion a couple times, and, and a lot of people don't like it. Hell, I would have kept them. I would have kept them as the backup even. I don't care about competition. To me, that's not you're like, oh, you're dividing the locker room. Yeah, bullshit. Yeah, these guys make a paycheck. These guys make a paycheck every week they play. Okay, so they're they're going to be professionals. They're going to support whoever. And um, yeah, and to me, it's like you know these these guys get hurt all the time. I mean, we saw the Vikings go through five quarterbacks. Yep. Yeah. So you know, I I wouldn't mind keeping them on the roster, no matter what kind of locker room drama that stirs up in the narratives of the media and whatnot. Because I I don't really buy into that stuff all too often. So you know, I I can see why they did move on from him though. And that return, man, you, you might as well have just traded him for like a bag of chips, right? You mentioned that Denver game, the 28 to seven that we lost, but arguably that that was at the Cleveland game too. And that's the one where Darnell Mooney dropped the Hail Mary at the end for us to lose. I mean, the ball hit him right in the stomach. I was right behind the play in the end zone. And that one was sickening to me. Because, I yeah. mean, I'm eating shit all the way out of the stadium. And then e- even in my car, the dude's listening to the Browns post game on the radio. And it's just and, like, and it's oh, the man. Browns, you know, like, Jesus. Yeah. yeah we, also the game where Robert Tunyon dropped like a awesome yes. leaf liquor? God. Absolutely. In the first and quarter. It was Halloween one year. And me and my friend went to Arizona. We went to go see a concert, Tool and Primus, um, which was badass. But, uh, we, you know, walking around on Halloween around – uh, ASU, Arizona State University, you got all these college kids everywhere, and I was just wearing my Jay Cutler jersey. And man, fights were breaking out around me from people arguing about Jay Cutler. They would just see my jersey, say something like, "Oh, Jay Cutler sucks," and somebody else would be like, "No, he doesn't." And this, and I would just sit back and just, just watch. Man, people, people are emotional, and For you know, record, even when the Bears Jay are fucking rocked, it, yeah, he he was pretty damn good. I love Jay Cutler. I know a lot of people don't. It's so weird at the the week four game in Chicago, I was seeing Denver Jay Cutler jerseys at Soldier Field. I didn't expect to see that. Ironically, I had a Cutler jersey on that day too. I had the the uh, night the old nineteen forties throwback, the one is blue with the orange C that they quit wearing after the seventeen season. I was wearing that one, uh, but yeah, I loved Cutler. Most people don't that I talk to on any of these shows, so that's interesting that you like Jake as well. Yeah, well, I mean, statistically, he's been the best quarterback we've had, you know, in recent times. I mean, you know, I'm 35 years old, so like, I was born in '88, I don't, not even in this country. Like, I don't, the '85 Super Bowl, it's all stories to me. Um, so everything I've known as a Bears fan, yeah, Jay Cutler's been the best quarterback we've had, and he's had a, you know, when he got here, I mean, his number one wide receiver was what Devin Hester. Johnny Knox is number two. He had a shit offensive line. You know, it got to a point where they were able to build that offense up for him. I know Mark Tressman's second year, the year that the defense set up three 50 pointers in a row. Right. Um, 20, but that offense, that offense was projected to be a top five offense. And I'm pretty sure they somewhat lived up to it. But just, just a little experience. Me and David went to the home opener that year against the Vikings and it was pouring rain. We're sitting under. Oh, uh, so he threw the touchdown to Martellus to win it, right? Wow, good yeah. memory, dude. Look at you know, it was terrible weather. It was pouring rain. We're sitting under the jumbotron, and I heard that the game got blacked out for a couple minutes on the broadcasts on TV. So people didn't get to see this, but we got to see this live. And this is when I, I knew this whole thing was fucked right during that game, during week one, because I believe we were either going for a touchdown at the goal line or it was a two-point conversion at the goal line, and they had come out in like a tight formation, one wide, Brandon Marshall out there. And the defense came out with the personnel to to accompany that. You know, they're coming out with heavy set personnel. And all of a sudden, we split Matt Forte out wide. All of a sudden, we split Martellus Bennett out wide. All of a sudden, Jay Cutler drops back in the shotgun. And now you have three wide shotgun, and the defense is looking around like, fuck, fuck. And you hear whistles, play gets blown dead for some, like, time clock bullshit, not even a penalty. The refs are just like, oh, you got to adjust the clock, this and that, replay the down. And and what do they do? They come out in a tight formation, (laughs) one wide. (laughs) And this time the defense, like, comes out in nickel. Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? I was just like, you can't, like, ah, the idea was there, but you can't just sit there and pretend you're going to fool them after you 
you know, I don't know. Uh, I always think like, it's kind of funny. Cause when I think of Jay Cutler, I fucking love Jay Cutler, but my biggest memory of him is the D'Angelo Hall, like four interceptions. The four picks against Washington. Just like yeah. where he's just like, I'm better than this guy. Fuck this guy. And it's like, eh, I don't know about that, man. You throw him four picks, but um, well, thing I like four picks against Green Bay in his opener as well. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, but you know, he came back and threw a touchdown to Devin Hester in the second half, and the Bears were in that game. They only lost. Oh, yeah. It was it was what, like something like 21 15? Off the top of my head, I don't know, but it was close. The D'Angelo Hall game, 17 to 14. So yeah, you're you're right there. I was talking to somebody where they said, you know, I'm I'm I hope Caleb Williams is a nice guy. And I was like, I don't know really why you care. Because we started with Jay Culler and he was an absolute dickhead, and everybody loved him. And then after Jay Culler, we kind of overcorrected and started getting like a bunch of nice guys. I remember Kyle Orton, and I remember thinking just like Kyle Orton's like a really nice guy. And I, I kind of wish like that's my opening season of fandom was 2005 against Carolina playoff season. Oh, right? Where, like, Charles Kyle Tillman Orton. got smoked in that oh, fucking game by Steve Smith. I remember just being like, I don't. Somebody was telling me I, it was my neighbor or something like that. Like, I hope Caleb Williams is just like a nice guy, and he, you know, he fits in Chicago. And I was like. I hope he's a fucking dickhead, but he wins 12 games a fucking year. Like, that's how I thought. Yeah, about Trubisky it. Was, was the nice guy. Yeah, and we had to turn off ESPN in the uh, in the team yeah, facilities. Yeah, he was. Yeah, because we he couldn't handle criticism. And then Justin Fields is, like, the nicest guy. And that's why I think, like, people uh, tend to, you know, hang on to Justin Fields for a while. It's like he had flashy plays, and he was fun. And so it's, like, it's fun to watch, but you probably shouldn't move on from that. And so, like, in my head, I was just like, man, I'm used to these nice guys the last five to seven years. You know, I had Mitch for five, for three, four years, and he was a nice guy, and I hope he would step up and get better and better. And, you know, then we got Justin, and he was even cooler and nicer and, you know, made even cooler plays. And now I'm just kind of like, you know what? I want a dickhead. I want Aaron Rodgers. I want somebody who, like, shuns their family and, you know, I don't know, so does some crazy outlandish shit, but he wins 12 games a year. I hope he's a dickhead, but he's just like an awesome quarterback. And that's well, where I'll go, I think I'll, Jay Cutler, you know? I'll go back to Jim McMahon, and McMahon was a guy that a lot of people would say was an asshole from the outside, but his fucking lineman loved him. Like, his, the offense loved him. And, you know, like I said, his pals were the five guys up front. So, and... and not to contradict you or anything, but I think that that's what I liked about Fields. Not so much that because his linemen sucked for the most part, but it felt like the team was at least behind him. And then if you recall that Falcons game on New Year's Eve with the crowd is chanting, we want Fields, we want Fields. I thought that there was a chemistry that the Bears hadn't had at that position in a really long time that the players are really behind him. Now, Jay had, you know, early on he had Greg Olson that loved him and then Brandon Marshall loved him when he loved him and hated him when he hated him, and Kyle Long loved him. But for the most part, he's sort of standoffish, you know? But again, he's a type 1 diabetic. He's always dealing with his blood sugar, and he's got other things he's constantly having to stress about on the sidelines, so he's not really cheery, and I get that. But I, I, it did seem like the team was really behind fields, and maybe that doesn't mean anything, but it felt like they had a chemistry and it, the Bears haven't really had good chemistry in years. But again, comparing it to McMahon is from the outside, people may have said, oh, he's an asshole, he's arrogant, but his teammates loved him, though. So if Caleb Williams could get the respect of his teammates and have them play hard for him, I think that's what I'm looking for. And if he's if he thinks I'm an asshole for wearing his jersey, then so be it. I mean, that's fine, as long as we win. I think at the end of the day, to like kind of summarize what David's saying, and like, dude, I think what we all want is production from the quarterback position. And I think we've gotten to a point where, like, no, to me, nothing nothing else matters. Like, I need production from the quarterback position. I need a guy to go out there and, you know, beat some of these records we, we've had. Like, only team without a 4,000-yard passer. I mean, this has gotten to a point where it's embarrassing. It the really most is. touchdowns by a player as a rookie in team history goes back to 1942, and it's 11. For quarterback in his rookie season, eleven touchdowns is the team record. That he he's got to break that this year. Maybe even the four thousand, yeah. but definitely the eleven. Come on, he's got to break that. You know, the so worst like, moment, other than Jay getting hurt, and then everyone saying he didn't have balls because he was fucking hurt. And I remember Olin Krutz saying that Jay came back to the huddle and his leg is shaking involuntarily, and he literally couldn't stop. His 
leg was throbbing and shaking and he couldn't put any weight on it. And that's why he went to the sideline to try to work it out. And people were calling Jay like, you know, a coward and all this, which is just completely egregious. But the worst moment of that game was that, and look, I'm 6'5", 300 pounds myself. I mean, but this pick fucking six, guy, that, that, fucking that pick tackle. six from the 400-pound man. Oh, my God. Ben, Raji, something Benji Raji, whatever yeah. his name, BJ Raji. BJ Raji. Oh, and that, God. That's, that's how you trick rookies. You know what I mean? You drop back the defensive tackle in the coverage. Like, come on, man. That's an easy read. It's a very easy read. I will argue to you all the worst one wasn't even the the championship game. The worst one for me was three years later, week 17, Green Bay, Chicago. The winner makes the playoffs, wins a division. The loser's out. We're up 28 to 20. And eventually, yeah, it's four. They had four straight fourth downs. They got, they couldn't get off the field. Julius Peppers has a chance to, to keep contained, doesn't. And Rodgers hits Randall Cobb, and Joe Co- Joe Buck's call was just Cobb and touchdown on like with what twenty seconds ago, fourth and thirteen or whatever. And that co- that's the only time in my life I threw a remote and broke it when Cobb scored. And then my wife at the time was like, "You know, you're a fucking idiot," and she was right, which made it even worse <laughs> that I broke the remote and she was talking shit to me. And that was like the worst law. I mean, that, that's right there. Probably the worst, most painful, even more than the Super Bowl in some ways. Well, that hurts for me. Like if we're talking painful memories here, I, man, this has turned into a therapy session real quick. Right. Um, I, the one that replaced in my head, I was dating a girl. We went to a party, some child's birthday party at her family's house. And it was like week seven or eight against the Chargers. When was Jake that when Color her- broke his thumb? fucking ran down his pick six and, oh yeah um and i i couldn't contain myself like in public and the worst part about that is you know they put caleb haney in there a couple weeks and eventually josh mccown wins one game they were seven and three when jay got hurt because remember they beat the chargers there too and i think they were uh, one they'd... and seven right yeah they 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 finished eight and eight but if they go nine and seven, they make the playoffs, and Jay could have come back from his surgery. But furthermore, you had Donovan McNabb, Chicago boy, on the fucking radio every week, basically begging to come back and give me a chance to play for my my hometown team. Please sign me. Please sign me. There's no way you can't tell me if they sign McNabb at what thirty five, he can't come in and win two games instead of Caleb Haney see these guys like tom brady who have multiple rings we see now patrick mahomes doing the same thing like we're sitting here talking about yesterday how you know is josh allen really a good quarterback can he get it done without weapons this and that meanwhile patrick mahomes just won his third super bowl with who now the scantling rashi rice like man when these guys hit they hit big right like the potential of the impact from that quarterback position is so huge that, you know, that's it's part of the reason why I understand the situation the Bears are in and why they want to roll the dice and gamble. It's still a gamble. There's no guarantee that Caleb Williams is going to be anything great. You know, there's people telling you that, yeah, he's the best prospect. Listen, Andrew Luck was a great prospect, too. He only l- lasted seven years in this league. For as great as he was, his longevity was not very great. You know what I mean? Dude, dude there's so many factors to this game and everything like that. However, I think we're in a position where, where we do have to gamble. And hopefully if we gamble and hit, man, we will hit big. I, I truly think so. I concur. I mean, there's been just so much losing and I don't, it's not, I'm just a fan. I get it. You know, I'm not one of the players, but this shit matters to me. And like, I've been loyal to these, like almost my entire life. Like, I was watching the regular season games as much as I could as far back as 87. when I I was still six and, and turned seven later that year. And again, I'm going to be 44 this fall. Yeah. So, like, I, I record every game. Every game. I've had Sunday ticket for almost 30 years, and I record every game. I've got all their playoff games going back to the 70s. I rewatch this shit. I'll, I'll rewatch the 88 NFC Championship game. I've probably rewatched it like 10 times over the years, rooting for a different outcome, which is, again, just like, what's wrong right. with me? The but that's how much I insanity. care about this. That's how much I care about it. Dude, I'm with you. And like, I was, you know, I'm, I'm big on analytics and big on numbers and whatnot. But like, in my opinion, um, the draft is 
a shit show. I, I feel like with the amount of players that get drafted in later rounds that wind up succeeding, especially at different positions and this and that, even even for pick one at quarterback to have like a 50% success rate just shows you that these guys don't really know what they're doing. I right. mean, they're hoping, you know what I mean? So I'm always one for like, give me more darts at the draft board and things like that. However, you know, recently I've kind of swayed off that a little bit, but during the John Fox era, we had three wins going into, you know, uh, the last week of the season. And I called in a waddle and Sylvie because Sylvie was like, well, if you, if you win this game, you get pick 14, but if you lose it, you got picked 10. And I, I believe that year we wound up uh, the next year we wound up taking um, Leonard Floyd, Leonard Floyd. And we wound up trading up for him anyway. And then Sylvie was like, see, you wouldn't have had to trade up if you would have just lost the last I game. I can't root for losses. Man. I, I was like, dude, I'm going to that game. Like I have tickets to go to the game. You want me to go and sit in those seats in late December, freeze my ass off, hoping the team loses. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I was like, I'm not doing it. And it, it, Finally, I shifted off that two years ago when David was like, listen, what do these meaningless wins mean at the end of the day when we have an opportunity to get pick one? Paul in Elmwood Park, you're on ESPN 1000. What do you think, Paul? Hey, so Black, um, I just want to specifically kind of direct this at you because I called in in the past uh, towards the end of the season, and I remember you're so stuck on this whole week to week. We 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 gotta win. We gotta win. I want to win. I want to win. Yeah. And so now we're in a situation where, um, you know, we might get a boatload of picks from Indianapolis and still be able to draft the guy we want anyway in Jalen Carter. So my question to you, Black, is yeah. now. Yeah. Now that you're out of that mindset of that whole week to week mentality and you could kind of take a step back and breathe and you're looking at it, what would you have rather had? The, the potential that we have now to trade and get all these picks from Indy or would you have rather, I don't know, beat the Packers and gotten a pointless win? We're already out of the playoff hunt and this and that. And I was like, okay, that is enticing enough for me to be like, all right. I don't I don't care if if we win these next couple of games. We need to ramp this thing up. We're definitely depleted on talent. And look, look, I mean it happened miraculously. We got pick one. We traded it back. Look at the the treasure it brought us. You know, DJ, I mean, dude, all the picks that he got too. He's hit on them too. It's great. It's great. Um DJ Moore being part of the trade was huge. So I I would say you've already won that trade. And now Caleb Williams could be a part of it too. And if he's anything like he's supposed to be, man, you not only won that trade, you really, you turn this whole thing around by being able to lose a couple of games at the end of the year. And it, really, that's the only situation where I've allowed myself to be a little bit vulnerable. Otherwise, I'm like, man, win every week, win every week. I don't care. I don't care what the record is. I don't care what our draft pick is. You know, all these teams that have won over and over, it didn't seem to bother the Patriots when they were drafting at the end of the rounds. doesn't seem to bother the Steelers when they're drafting at the end of the rounds. They seem to do just fine, right? In week 18, which ended up being Justin's final start as a Bear, in theory, that helped the Bears by losing that game, get the ninth pick. Okay, great. I'm glad that's where we have it now. But on, on January 7th or 8th, whatever that day was, I wanted the Bears to win and knock Green Bay out of the playoffs. Yeah. And right. I would and never it, change that. Like going back to that, there's no way I watch that and think, oh, I hope the Bears get a better draft pick and lose to the Packers again. Fuck that. <laughs> Jay Cutler, but my biggest memory of him is the D'Angelo Hall, like four interceptions. The four picks against Washington. Just like, yeah. where he's just like, I'm better than this guy. Blitz coming. And D'Angelo Hall, and as a result of that, Cutler's thrown off his back foot, and it's a ball he just threw in behind. He couldn't, he had no chance of completing. Line with a man to beat. He got a block, and Hall will go the distance. Uh, I don't know about that, man. You threw him four picks, but um, Wasn't the there I like four him? picks against Green Bay in his opener as well? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, but you know, he came back and threw a touchdown to Devin Hester in the second half, and the Bears were in that game. They only lost. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was what, like something like 21-15? Off the top of my head, I don't know, but it was close. The D'Angelo Hall game, 17-14. to 14. Other than Jay getting hurt, I remember Olin Krutz saying, that Jay came back to the huddle and his leg is shaking involuntarily. And he literally couldn't stop. His leg was throbbing and shaking and he couldn't put any weight on it. 
And that's why he went to the sideline to try to work it out. And people were calling Jay like, you know, a coward and all this, which is just completely egregious. But the worst moment of that game. That pick tackle. six from the 400 pound man. Oh my God. BJ Raji. BJ Raji. Oh, Dude, and that, God. That's, that's how you trick rookies. You know what I mean? You drop back the defensive tackle in the coverage. Like, come on, man. That's an easy read. The worst one for me, week 17, Green Bay, Chicago. The winner makes the playoffs, wins the division. The loser's out. We're up 28 to 20. Yeah, it's four. They had four straight fourth downs. They got, they couldn't get off the field. Rodgers. Julius Peppers has a chance to, to keep contained, doesn't. And Rodgers hits Randall Cobb and Joe Co Joe Buck's call. Rodgers gets out, floats it, Cobb! It was just Cobb and touchdown on like with what, 20 seconds ago, fourth and 13 or whatever. And that Cobb, that's the only time in my life I threw a remote and broke it when Cobb scored. And then my wife at the time was like, you know, you're a idiot and she was right which made it even worse the, the one that hurts for me like if we're talking painful memories went to a party some child's birthday party at her family's house and it was like week seven or eight against the chargers when was Jay that when color broke his thumb and ran down his pick six and, oh yeah um and i i couldn't contain myself like in public in front of seven and three bears family. and the, yeah, you oh know the God. worst part i knew it i knew it I, I was like this is falling apart this is all gonna fall apart now and the worst part about that is, you know, they put Caleb Haney in there a couple weeks, and eventually Josh McCown wins one game. They were seven and three when Jay got hurt, because remember they beat the Chargers there too. And I think they were uh, one they, and seven, right? Yeah, they 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 finish eight and eight. But if they go nine and seven, they make the playoffs, and Jay could have come back from his surgery. But furthermore, you had Donovan McNabb, Chicago boy, begging to come back and give me a chance to play for my, my hometown team. 